So I was actually reading the uh, RCL20, and uh, BEEP is uh, apparently was the, the, the either idea of a PDA that was going to run your life for you. Um, that's, not, that's not this BEEP. This is actually about audio output. Um, I just, to set a little bit about who I am, this is another thing that I've been involved in. It's, uh, it's bronze sculptures made with 3D printing and mathematics. So I, I have an interest in the, in the confluence of art and software and technology. Uh, so th these, are, these are actually, I wrote some code in Python to generate these shapes and then use this tool chain, including uh, OpenSCAD, to generate them. So this is just to give you an idea of where, where, my, where my mind comes from. Uh, since we're in London, uh, and this is sort of about the, the future of technology, this is, this, the, the city is an amazing play, an amazing resource in terms of the history of technology. These are, uh, I think all three of these are from the, the Museum of Science. So you have the mechanical calculators, you have the, uh, some, I think this was in the communication section. I think those are all uh, capable of communicating. And that, I believe, is a piece of a differential analyzer, which, uh, uh, but that's that's the past. So we're hope, talking about what I hope is the is uh, is the future, the the vibrant future of uh, pocket uh, portable electronic devices. So, um, actually, I think I did write some of this thirty thousand feet when I was on my way from uh, Albuquerque to Chicago. Uh, so, uh, and I was adding slides even even this morning. So this is this is really and truly a work in progress. And I blame, at least in part, for that. Um, although, no, I, I don't really blame Mark. Because any, any, any problem is, is Mark's. But he did have a problem with his spam filter. So I kept saying, I'd like to give this talk. I'd like to give this talk. And I got this, this silence back. So I thought there was this, this amazing cathedral-like edifice of the HPCC in London that was, you know, well, these, you know, you, ha you have to be vetted by the appropriate committees. And you have to submit in triplicate. And you haven't done that. So we aren't even going to deign to reply to you. But apparently it was just sitting in his spam folder because as soon as I emailed, he said, oh, yes, we'd, we'd love to have you. So, <laughs> OK, so this is uh, three parts. The first part is it should be done. So in other words, why, why do we care about uh, having a high fidelity audio output on, on a pocket calculator? So first of all, the one, one of the markets where calculators are still uh, alive is uh, in, in the educational market. So people still, still want to teach them. People teach math about them. Uh, and, the, and the graphing calculators, the graphic capabilities that you have in the, in the prime are, are things that are, that are actually used. Um, music has, has some mathematical character. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, DSP, if, if you could teach people how to use DSP, I'm, as I've thought about this, I think this, this might be a little harder to do because uh, to really code DSP, you probably should have a workstation, not, not try and uh, enter, enter code on, the, uh, on, on a calculator keyboard. But um, at least you could motivate it, and, and, and uh, it does have some other advantages, which we'll, we'll talk about later. So um, th this was... Uh, <laughs> how, did everyone raise it? I think I got, I got a few people there. Yeah, that was... Uh, I, I remember annoying everybody in high school and telling them about how great this book was. Probably one of the, I, I've been annoying people about multiple different things I've been enthusiastic for over the years. This was one of the first. But uh, the, um, if, you, if you think about, if, I don't know how many of you, how many of you play an instrument? Oh, almost everybody. So you know that you know, when transposition, if you say, well, we're going to move this from C up to a different, a different uh, uh, key, then... <laughs> Then that, that's simply addition, right? It really is just addition. Addition modulo 12, right? Uh, uh, retrograde is less reverse. In inversion is really interesting. I actually went and uh, I, I had to remind myself of this. In inversion is actually a slightly more complicated mathematical construct. It doesn't turn out to be inversion in the way you would think of it from, from Python. Yeah, it's, it's actually, uh, well, anyway, we'll get to that. Um, so first of all, it's uh, when you invert a chord, versus inverting a melody, that, that means two different things. Uh, so, uh, let's see, what did I put here? So, yeah, so essentially, rather than, if you, you have it, then everything sort of flips upside down. So rather than looking at the notes themselves, what you're really looking at is the intervals between the notes. So if a melody goes da, 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 instead it would go da, 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 da. So it would go down and then up, rather than up and then down. 
Uh, whereas inversion and accord, if you have the, uh, so these are both, uh, both C chords, the, the inversion actually changes what's in there. An inversion in, uh, in, the, in the melody changes the, it's the notes are gonna be different because you're going in different directions. But here, this is shifted up by an octave. So this C has been moved up an octave for the first inversion, and then you shift up the, uh, the, the uh, EE as well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so this is my, uh, my proposal. Uh, one, of the, one of the proposals here is, uh, is reverse, reverse Polish music. Uh, because we went from RPN to RPL, we jumped right over M, so I'm, I'm, I'm filling that in. Uh, again, it's not Chopin played backwards to reveal satanic communications from, from the 19th century. Uh, but it would be uh, a way of, of modifying uh, musical material so that you could actually uh, in your hands sort of modify things and adjust them and, and sort of say what would it be like if I, if I played this this way? What would it be like if I did uh, different combinations of it? So you could like uh, a vertical concatenation would be taking two melodies and playing them on top of each other which can result in a mess but if you're J.S. Bach or someone similar to that you can create a, you can create a fugue uh, if they fit properly. Um, uh, the other transformations, and then in modal adjustments, there's, uh, there's a variety of, in addition, we're, we're, most people are familiar with major keys and minor keys, but there's also Mixolydian and Locrian, which uh, sounds terrible unless you're a jazz fan, I guess. But I'm feeling really bad because I, I know this is being recorded for posterity. I'm saying all these things. I'm going to get in so much trouble for all this. But the has to be down in the basement here. You want to go there after the conference. Or in real life. Okay. All right. I will do that then. Um, so then since I just, I, I, this, this doesn't really exist, right? I, I don't actually have a, a, an RPM of RPM to use Linux terminology. Uh, but like rests also are sort of weird. They exist outside of the space of a note. So you have to, they exist in time, but not in tonal space. So there, there's ways in which this, this has to be done. I had an idea of an environment, which would be, in other words, how you interpret a set of numbers into a musical form uh, you could say, uh, you could sort of default, um, oh, I didn't put that in there. Well, anyway, I was sort of saying the, envir the idea of the environment would be, uh, maybe it's another slide. Uh, yeah, oh, here it is. So you could say, if I give you uh, a number, the default is I'm assuming it's C major, I'm assuming it's a quarter note, assuming four, four times, 60 beats per minute and a piano sound. So if I just say play a one, it's gonna go bing, and then that's, that's what you're gonna get. And then you could change all of that in another way, um, uh, moving things up and down. I, since I don't have examples of all of this, I um, want, want to go back. And there's other things, these are not, the math is, is not really mathematical, right? You have, there's 12 notes in a scale, but there's seven in the, in the solfage, and that's because there's the room in between for the different, uh, uh, the different uh, modulations into different keys. So here's an example of of a possible set of key presses you could use to do something. So I, I create a list, uh, one, two, three, four. I enter it twice onto the stack, three uh, transpose. So I transpose the, the first one by, by three semitones up, and then I combine them. And that would give you a melody instead of going da 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 da, it would go da 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 da, da 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 da, like that. Um, and then you'd have eight notes and then the play key would play it. So this is all something that you could do that would be, I think, possibly of interest for people who could actually use this and, and learn about musical composition and techniques. Um, and then I put this one, I didn't tell you what these are. This is retrograde and that's an inversion key. So you could then, you could then build up uh, different, uh, different musical forms uh, sim simply on a key. Um, Believe it or not, there's people who do uh, similar things like this with laptops. There are actually people who do live, live coding. They'll sit there with Macs or with some other programming environment. They'll get in front of a group of people, sometimes even more people in the room than this, if you can believe it, and, uh, and perform live by live coding. So this is actually a thing that, that, that exists in the world. Uh, there's other uh, connections between math and, and music. There's uh, Euclidean rhythms. Uh, Godfrey de Saint was a a professor of computer science and actually has uh, published a number of papers and he noticed that there was this mathematical underpinning of a lot of different rhythms. 
and it's it's related to Euclid's uh, Euclid's algorithm. And essentially, it's it, it's also an algorithm that's useful for a variety of other things, including in um, nuclear uh, engineering, where you try and see if you have k possible places to put something, and you have n uh, excuse me, k points over n places to put them. You want to put them as evenly as possible. And so he has this this method of doing that, and it turns out that here's uh, something from the from his uh, his paper uh, where you have. So this is 3 over 8, which is, turns out to be the Cuban tercio, which is a rhythm that's used in, in some Cuban music. And then there's 5-8 as their, the cinquio. And so you can see that he's fig the, the algorithm will figure out how to space these as evenly as possible in the, in the, in the area that there is. Now, digital signal processing is something that is, is is giant. I, I uh, recently I have another project I was working on, and I, I had an idea. Well, I'm going to try and see if I can find someone to help me with this. So I talked to somebody who was in the electronic music business, making synthesizer modules. And he said, "Oh yeah, you can you can find people who'll do DSP for you about two hundred thousand dollars a year, and then you'll you'll get one." And uh, so I decided maybe there's some open source stuff that I can use instead. Um, so. Uh, just, just in general terms, even just the most basic stuff of just how do you get the audio from from a computer into in, uh, uh, data from a computer into an audio format. So there's the there's the codecs, there's the transformations, there's uh, you know the bit rate uh, and, and all of that. But then there's also these other things where bit crushing, whereas instead of having say uh, 16 bits at 48 kilohertz, you drop it down to 12, then 10, then 8, then it starts getting noisy, and then you drop it down below that, it just it just turns into this complete grunge. But that's actually something that people find musically interesting. Um, remember, there's no such, uh, every, every sound is potentially interesting musically to somebody. Uh, and then there's just a variety of different forms of synthesis of sound directly. You can just have, uh, have simple digital oscillators, or you can have an models of analog oscillators, uh, like the old Moogs or Ar ARPs that, that you, you might remember. Uh, or you can have physical modeling of things where people will actually figure out, uh, I think the, I mentioned, I was telling some people earlier about a Korg Oasis I have that has this string model, so that they actually say, what is a string, a vibrating string, what's the physics of that? And then you can model the tension and the length and the weight and whether it's anchored at one end or another. Like for example, one of the differences between a sitar and a guitar is that the sitar has a, has a, a moving bridge essentially, so that's why they get that, that that distinctively, uh, wait, 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 at least I think of as that sort of that, that Indian sound that you get, um, and you can model all that physically, <coughs> and that, that's something that people do. Now, it's um, these are things that require a lot of uh, of, of of power, uh, and if you're really going to design the the algorithms themselves, if you're going to implement bit crushing or delay or reverb or any of these things, you'd have to write it probably in a low level language. Python is not going to not going to work very well for you, but if in terms of like, if you just want to do it as sort of an educational thing or as a, a performance-oriented thing, you can do it graphically. Um, I don't think the the symbolic method works so well, but there's I just have a couple of examples. Uh, this is just an example from the Teensy Audio Library. They have a variety of different bits and pieces, and then you connect them up graphically because you're essentially sort of building a machine, right, that has the inputs and goes through various transformations to the outputs, and then you link them up. Uh, a much more advanced one. Uh, that I that I use quite a bit in, in another part of my life is something called Kima. They they have an outboard DSP, and they have this uh, this development system that lets you say. So the, this is, for example, uh, a noise generator, and you feed it into this uh, decay, and then this is a, a a sort of reverb, the cross filter reverb, and then all these other things go out, and then you have um, the the ultimate sound that you can you can play. And each one of these has this provides this little box-like thing, so you can you can change the parameters internally to it, and that's probably a way that's sort of in between actually coding at the at the lowest level, and then or, or just or just using some preset thing that just does something. You can you can uh, work work on something like this. Now this is something that runs on a runs on a on a, on a PC like this, but you can imagine making a smaller version of it that would fit into uh, into something of the form factor of a prime or something like that. Any questions? You have questions, but you're not going to ask them. Okay, all right. <laughs>
Well, that's... But at the end, you have finished yet, or have you finished? No, I'm not done yet. I just, I just wanted to pause for a moment because... Well, just, just a little bit of listening. Can, can you go, go back one slide and continue on your things? So that, that's the sort of thing you can imagine going on calculator. Low power, low um, CPU. I think so. I mean, I, I think I have a whole other, uh, getting another section, but I think that, just, just to give a little preview, we, we've gotten to the point where these, where the, where the, uh, the ability of, of calculators to do things like this has, has caught up to, to the demands of, 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 of high fidelity audio. Uh, and the display part, this is super easy. I think, you know, the, 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 the graphing that it does and the ability to set little forms and fill in different bits and pieces of it, and the little editors it has, it's, it's already, already there in many ways. Um, so I said, uh, music is not really math, actually, it turns out. Um, and then the, the calculators, the, the physical form factor of them is they don't really have any, any way to do pressure sensitivity. It's either on or off. So if you want to be like expressive, like if you think about someone playing a violin, they have the ability to put vibrato in and, and really every little subtle movement of the way they're, they're holding their fingers is being translated into some characteristic of the sound. Whereas now there's, this, this doesn't, a calculator as it is doesn't really allow that. Everything is going to be sort of quantized and chunked. Now there is a whole universe of, of music where that's not just, that's actually part of the aesthetic of it is that it is that way. Although it's interesting, I mentioned Roger Lynn, I think a little later, he actually sort of apologized to the world for coming out with a drum machine and, and sort of destroying pop music as he saw it because everything became quantized and regimented and, and you know, and it wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't feel too bad about putting the drummers out of business, that, that was, but, but just that the music was so bad. Uh, so some way of doing, um, some, some way of fixing that. Uh, just, just an idea of like the other thing, so here, uh, I mean, there's these different aspects of it, little crescendos and decrescendos and ties and, and little comments in French to, or Italian to tell you what you're supposed to be doing at different parts. So there, there's a lot more to music than, than that, um, the speed ups and the slow downs. And ultimately, right, the goal of music is not just to generate some sort of mathematical format, but to get people, this actually is um, at the uh, Alley Pally, at the Al Alexander Palace. Uh, Franz Ferdinand, Thursday night, was pretty terrific. So, I don't know whether this is really possible, but you can take sort of imagine taking a keyboard and then a key, and instead of just having the spring where, where it says there's been a button press, you could put some sort of pressure sensitive material underneath it, so after you press it, you could continue pressing and get a readout of, of some sort of pressure on it, which would have the advantage of uh, not changing the form factor of the calculator very much, but be giving you the ability to to uh, do pitch bending or speed ups and slow downs and other sorts of more what I consider performance oriented material. You, you could do something like that. There's a certain irony there that HP have a patent on this and yet we've had some howlers of keyboards recently that don't register keys or register them twice and that sort of thing. So they're clearly not only lost the source code, but they've got on their own patents for this Well, um, you know, Google still has the patents, so if they want to find them, that, that, that much they should be able to find again. But uh, at any rate, that's, um, that is uh, an invention that's not been invented yet. And also, I, I'm sort of wondering whether it's really the right way to do it, because you think, I don't know whether there's more to the key, but if you think about the key pressing that and sort of smushing the, the metal plate into a pressure sensor, probably not the best way to do it. Probably better to have that have the peg of the key actually pressing against something separate so that the so that you're not you're not stressing the spring by pressing it. Yamaha have patents on all of this. <laughs> yeah. Every possible way of doing that. Well I, I have to think that the original ones must be out of uh, must no longer be operative because the I think it was the the Yamaha C S eighty was the is a, an amazing uh, synthesizer, which fortunately I don't have room for, otherwise I'd be trying to figure out how I could get one that has actually polyphonic aftertouch. Most keyboards have have aftertouch that have aftertouch have just one sensor, so you can play a chord and you can press it, you can make it swell or not. That one actually each key had a separate ability to be be pressed individually, um, and there are other things now that have polyphonic aftertouch. You can get a Linstrument, for example. Probably before you would have aftertouch, you probably would want to have a velocity so you could actually get the intensity. You know, like if you hit the key 
correctly. Uh, you know, very quiet, you get very quiet sounds, and if you really hit uh, fast and hard, you get uh, very loud, so it's fun, you know. Um, and that would be done by timing, actually. You, you could, but actually the Lindstrom-in, it's interesting, if you have per key pressure, then that turns out to be essentially equivalent to velocity, because if you touch it gently, you get a gentle amount of pressure. And if you touch it hard, you get a hard amount of pressure. So the, the, the Lindstrom-in keys are, they look like little flat bits of plastic. So they don't have the feel of a piano, but you can still play it and get, get that. I'm, I'm not very good at mine, and I didn't bring it, because it's, it's a little large, but... Okay, so previous section was it should be done. This section was it can be done. So um, basically three reasons. One, the processors exist, the batteries exist, and, uh, and there's uh, relatively accessible chips that provide audio output that you could, you could integrate into a calculator. And I've chosen the SGTL 5000 as an example of that. So um, the processors, the, the processors that are there in, uh, in, the, in the current calculators, and I think even the even like the previous generation are actually powerful enough to generate to generate uh, high fidelity, you know, synthesizer uh, quality uh, audio output. Um, and I just I'd forgotten this Acorn Risk Machine. They actually have some of the early ones. And one of the fascinating things you go to the science museum. I really am in a hurry, but they actually had one of the early. ARM processors, and they realized they hadn't hooked up the power supply to it, but it was still running because it used such little power <laughs> that it was actually able to leach power off of the rest of the circuit. There's someone talking about that in the Science Museum if you go by that. Anyway, um, so there's a, I, I have some electronic, you may have guessed, I have some electronic musical instruments at home. Uh, Mutable Instruments is a manufacturer of them. Uh, there's another company called, um, uh, oh, well, anyway, so the, the Teensy, it's also used, and these are, as, as I point out, uh, very similar to what's in calculators. I think, in fact, that, that uh, this, this model is quite close to the model that, that um, uh, was, was discussed earlier as going into, the, into, into some of the newer calculators. Um, there, there is an issue, which is that when, when people write code for a synthesizer module, they generally take over the entire processor. So there's nothing left over for anything. And, and that's just because, you know, the demand, the, the, if, you're, if you're selling something that's just going to be a synthesizer module, then you want to make sure that every cycle is being used. But I think that there's enough headroom between 72 megahertz and say 400 that you can probably, probably make this work. Um, so the batteries, lithium batteries, I don't, I, I, I uh, I don't think you'd want to do this on just a coin cell because the amount of power would, would, would chew it up pretty quickly. But if you have a lithium battery, then I think you're going to be fine. Uh, and again, this is the uh, a chip. This is used all over the place. I was telling people earlier, I, I just looked at DigiKey, uh, and they have 36,000 odd of these available right now and uh, th uh, and uh, $3 if you buy if you buy a thousand of them so uh, and it's it's a one chip so you don't don't need it. It, it it provides the headphone output it, it doesn't require a capacitor which I know Chuck will be very happy to hear that you don't need an extra capacitor there <laughs> put in there and uh, I was reminded I left out of the slide uh, the, these things are driven by I2S so and th those pins all exist there's usually many, many, many of those pins available, and you just run one of them to this chip, and then and there you go, and then you add the software, which I agree is non-trivial, but the, the hardware is, is not, not, not a difficult aspect of it. Um, there's other ways of getting audio out of a, out of a device. Um, and I, was, I don't think having loud speakers on, on your, if you're going for the educational market, you probably don't want the kids, uh, kids doing that, but. Okay, and the, the final is, it must be done. Why must it be done? Well, it already has been done. There are, are actually are devices out there in the world that do uh, things kind of like this. The, the, there's something called a tracker, which is a, a, a category of musical instrument or musical product, sound production tool that I, I personally don't find terribly interesting, but it's designed to essentially be very grid-oriented where you, where you fill in different bits and pieces and, and create, uh, create music uh, from, from the ground up uh, by adding bits uh, one after another. Uh, but the, uh, 
the Teenage Engineering Pocket Operators, which some people have, have seen, and the OPZ, which is what I'm going to show in a little bit. And apparently, I don't know what this is. This was at the uh, Musical Instrument Museum, so this was a, an early version of a, not quite portable, but we went from the 85 to the 75, so maybe we can go from this to a, to a calculator. Um, and so that was that. The other thing I have to show, if I can do this, hopefully it's the right one here. No, not that. Oh, wait. Oh, that's not the right audio output. Let me just, yeah. Um, preferences output. Samsung. So, uh, you can certainly sell one to Kraftwerk. That's the, uh, that's the point. But um, I just wanted to show this. Um, I said that these devices already exist. This is not a calculator, obviously, but it has a similar form factor in that it's, it's relatively small. It, uh, as I said, runs off a lithium battery. I think it has, somebody I think knew which processor. It's one of the processors, I think, or a very close relative of one of the ones that I mentioned. And if this works. The other thing it has is, most of these buttons are just buttons. It does have one area where you can, uh, where you can uh, do a little pressure sensitivity here, if I can get this thing. So that's, um, that's different kinds of sounds. I'm going to try this. And another thing that it has, which is also be relatively easy to integrate, I didn't really talk too much about this, is different um, uh, rotating controllers, so you can... And the way this one is designed is, um, it's incredibly cryptic, but you figure it out. It sort of teaches you because you understand. So. This is um, the program, so it's uh, on, uh, on zero, and it's on the, the first one, so if I press play. But it, it has a variety of other functions, so you can, you can, you can put music into it, and, and people, there's a, I have to give a shout out because Cuckoo was the first person who I, I saw do this. He demonstrated at Moogfest a number of years ago. And there are people who actually show up on stage with just this and they play it. So there, there actually would be a market beyond just the educational market. There would be people who, um, who, who would, would buy this. Not just me, but other people. And uh, have some sort of story you know, story work, right? So the work on the computer or something like a bag? Uh, yeah, well this one, um, if I just maybe just remove this. So yeah, this one also has USB-C and so you can save, you can save what's on there. It also has, uh, it has a fair amount of internal uh, flash storage so it, it remembers what you've done uh, and, and it's available there uh, for whenever you, whenever you need it. But you can back it up, you can store it. Uh, you can also, it, it's largely, um, if I put this back, it's driven largely by samples, so if I go to the, uh, let's say, what's one of these? Oh, so here's the, the bass drum, for example. And I can change different settings, so that's uh, setting one, and then two, and three. I don't know if you can hear that. This is a, and those are all samples that you can record into it. You can generate your own samples. It has tools to, to, to put samples into it. Um, and I, I, you can also, I think, drive this off of a sequencer, and you can use this to drive other things. This thing actually has, I'm not here to talk about this, but it's kind of crazy what this thing can do. It also has the ability to control lighting. It has a, a whole, uh, there's some standard for controlling lighting, and one of the tracks is actually the lighting. And other tracks are sort of programmable, where you can change it so it can adjust things based on a step-by-step -step basis. It has 16 tracks, not all of them are audio tracks. If you heard, it was that, 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 that sequence it was playing, you could hear a bass drum, you could hear a bass, 
you could hear. It also has a, it has one of the synthesizer modules in it is uh, supposed to be a chord. So if I set it to this one, wait, no, the, this one rather. Well, except for that it's, um, it's doing the, ar it's arpeggiating for some reason. Uh, can I change that? Uh, I can't. But at any rate, it does have the ability to, oh, maybe that's because that's the arpeggio. Oh, that's, that's, the, that's the arpeggio, that's why. This is the chord. Yeah, so you can hear that it's, and that's just one track of the 16, not all the 16 tracks are audio tracks, but you can, you can, uh, this is just an example of what, what, what can be done with it. Yeah. I, I don't think there's, well, it's specifically not a DSP chip. I think it's just got, it's, it has an ARM chip in it. I, I'm not actually sure what the distinction is. People talk about, uh, I think some of the ARMs have more DSP and like, like instructions that make certain algorithms easier. It's where, it's where it takes us to data, data additional construction and then it sort of articulates that into an algorithm. Right, but I mean, in terms of like the distinction between a, a chip that you call a DSP chip or a chip that you call a CPU, it's, I don't, I don't think that distinction is as... Yeah. Uh, so this ARM port is like a uh, F series from SDM. I think it probably has Neon, which is sing these are single instruction up to four data samples per instruction that it does the same operation on. So you do get accelerated calculation compared to just running set A and C code, but it's not doing all vector of samples in one instruction. Yeah, I think so that I knew there would be somebody who knew. Thank you. <laughs> so uh any other questions?